Osteobites is a weekly osteosarcoma webinar and podcast presented by MIB agents. Today, we are speaking with Dr. Sulanga Banerjee, a research scientist with the University of Miami Health System and associate professor at University of Miami's Miller School of Medicine. I'm your host, Ann Graham, president of MIB agents. Welcome to Osteobites from our new Osteo Warriors and MIB agents headquarters. We've had a break and now we're back and we got a new office. So really excited about that. And i um, also really excited about my snack today. I hope you remembered yours. Mine is a delightful Girl Scout Samoan knockoff, which I can't sadly get enough of. Um, I hope you have your snacks ready and let's go because today we are speaking with Dr. Sulagna Banerjee. She is a research scientist with the University of Miami Health System and associate professor at the University of Miami's Miller School of Medicine. I'm your host, Anne Graham, an osteo warrior myself and also president of MIB Agents. MIB Agents is a leading pediatric osteosarcoma nonprofit dedicated to making it better for our community of patients, caregivers, doctors, and researchers with the goal of less toxic, more effective treatments and a cure for this aggressive bone cancer. We support our doctors, researchers, and the medical community a number of ways, including our annual Factor Conference, our annual Outsmarting Osteosarcoma Research Grant, the book, Osteosarcoma From Our Family to Yours, which is really great for patients, which supports doctors in return, um, and our Osteobytes weekly webinar. We support kids and families with osteosarcoma through our Gamer Agents Program, our Ambassador Agents Program, Asian Writers for Kids in Treatment, Missions for Kids in Hospice Care, and Healing Hearts for Bereaved Parents. That's our story at MIB, and we're ready to go. So Dr. Banerjee, would you get us started by introducing yourself, please? So I am, um, as Anne said, my name is Sulagna Banerjee. I am an associate professor at the Department of Surgery, University of Miami in Florida. I'm not in the fun campus, I'm in the medical campus, which is in the sad downtown, non-beach, not fun part of the city. And that actually, I tell my staff that that's actually really good because it helps them to keep really focused on their research. Um, what else? So my, I, I, in general, I work on tumor metabolism and my focus is pancreatic cancer and recently it has become osteosarcoma and that's why I'm here. Awesome. So out your window there is not the beach? It's not the beach. Just on your tissue box? It's actually the highway and a very crowded one. So, um, my topic is a little misleading, though I say that it's mouse models to test immunotherapy and combinations, uh, immunotherapy combinations in osteosarcoma. I'm actually going to talk a little bit about the project which kind of um, got me involved in osteosarcoma, and that is how different metabolic inhibitors, or one metabolic inhibitor in this case, um, actually has shown us really promising uh, preclinical lab data, which shows that it can sensitize osteosarcoma to immune therapy. And I'm gonna just build up on that, but before that, kind of as a continuation of my introduction, this is my lab or my, uh, this is the institute. And this was, this picture was snapped during the COVID-19 lockdown. It's usually not as empty. It's packed because right where you see the umbrella is a Starbucks. So you have plenty of students and plenty of researchers hanging out there discussing very high level science as they do their research. Um, and this is my wonderful team of six people. And of these, these two wonderful ladies, uh, Vanessa Goredo and Beatrice Matteo Victoriano are the two people who have been actively helping me in doing these research on osteosarcoma studies and immune therapy with this um, metabolic inhibitor. So going forward, um, so cancer is something that has been around for a very long time. In fact, um, studies have shown that cancer was first identified in Egyptian mummies. So really, really, really long time. And However, the research to cure cancer or to conquer cancer has been around for the last 70 or 80 years, about like 1950s or so. Um, in the last, I would say 30 years, when uh, a Dr. Weinberg was an eminent tumor biologist, felt the need that 
we have now understood cancer enough that now we can define it with different definitive hallmarks, which can across different tissue cancers, we can kind of say that, okay, what do we mean by cancer? So in 2000, he came up with this um, six parameters, which he called the hallmarks of cancer. But fortunately or unfortunately after that, around 2000, when the genome of the, the human genome got published, we understood the researchers and the field and the physicians, we understood so much more about cancer and so much more different pathways that it felt that these hallmarks were not enough to define cancer. So just 11 years later, he actually revisited his paper and he made a new study, new um, sort of a review of his older um, study in which he expanded his hallmarks. And this time he had two things, two of his hallmarks, which we are gonna focus on, which is actually my research, um, which made it to his hallmarks um, list. One was deregulating cellular energetics and the other one was avoiding immune destruction. And these two features beca are becoming more and more um, important in, in terms of um, developing a viable therapy for cancer, any kind of cancer. And what is interesting is over the last about five to 10 years, what we've realized that immunology and tumor metabolism, which is another easier way of saying deregulated cellular energetics, are actually very dependent on each other and they actually feed off each other. And that's where we start the, I start my research. So what do we mean by cell, deregulated cellular energetics or tumor metabolism? So when in a normal tissue, you have, um, you know, the cell takes up glucose and it metabolizes it and it metabolizes it so that it can get energy. So that's what happens if you, see, if you follow the arrow where it says plus oxygen in the oxygenated surroundings, the cell will take up the glucose and send it through this energy factory within it called the mitochondria to release a lot of ATP, which is actually the currency for energy. And in a normal situation when it doesn't have oxygen, for example, when you're exercising really hard and your muscles get tired and because it runs out of oxygen because you're breathing very fast, so then another mechanism kicks in, which is not very energy efficient, but it will still give you a little bit of energy. So instead of 36 ATP, it will give you two ATP, and that is called the anaerobic metabolism. So anaerobic as in an absence of oxygen. And this is the one which makes lactate. Now cancer cells, as we all know now that the cancer cells hijack whatever works for them from the normal cells. So very conveniently, the cancer cells hijack this non-oxygen anaerobic glycolysis or non-oxygen dependent metabolism. Now, if you look at the right side of the screen, you can see that in a tumor cell, about 85% of the glucose makes oxygen, makes lactate, whether or not there is oxygen present. And this had perplexed people for a very long time because why would a cancer cell, which is very dependent on um, uh, active proliferation or active division, why will it take an energy inefficient method to do it? And what we do when we cannot understand anything is we shelf it, we put it in the back burner and not worry about it. And that's what happened because this was observed first in 1930s. And till for the next 50 years or so, it was put in a back burner where um, people didn't quite, didn't know what to do with it. It was only in the last about 15 years or so that people started kind of looking into it. It was like, okay, we found that there was this inefficient way of utilizing a metabolite and why does the tumor need to do it and in fact in the last few years it has it is becoming more and more apparent that the tumor cells are more dependent on lactate than anything else so this is not a waste product of the cell now i know this slide is really busy and this is to tell you basically that what are the different pathways or what are the different factors that a tumor that a lactate can influence in a tumor cell so if you can see there's a lot of Big words here, but the take home message is that the lactate which is produced, secreted out of the tumor cells can help in metastasis. It is in the absolute right side, right corner of the cell. Um, metastasis is when the tumor spreads from its primary location to different other, to other locations. It can help in what is called immune escape and we'll come to it in a little bit. So basically immune escape is when the tumor cells escape recognition by the police force of the body or the immune cells. It can also help in formation of new blood vessels, and that is not a good thing 
because which means that there can the tumor can now have, have more and more supply of nutrients which will help it to grow faster and multiple other things which will help it in growing and proliferating and eventually surviving. So we talked about immune, immune escape. Immune escape is becoming a very big, um, uh, if I may say, headache for people who are developing therapy for cancer because it stands right in the way of developing immune therapy. And why do we care about immune therapy anyway? We care about immune therapy because unlike the normal traditional chemotherapy drugs or radiation, which kill both cancer cells as well as healthy cells, immune therapy will only selectively kill cancer cells. And this is a very big deal. And it is basically a mechanism by which it will make the patient's own immune system to act on the cancer cells specifically, leaving the healthy cells alone. And that will result in a much effective cure in an ideal world. So we talked a little bit about the immune escape, and this is a cartoon which shows that what, how the lens at which the cancer cells go to, to maintain that escape or evasion. So first of all, what they do, they recruit these specialized immune cells called Tregs, and my lied, uh, the, I'm, I'm gonna just go ahead and use the acronym, MDSCs. Um, normally, an immune recognition of any foreign body is dependent on presentation of specific antigens or flags on its surface, which will help these immune cells to come and destroy the cells. Um, cancer cells, they have a very ineffective presentation of these flags or antigens, and that prevents them, the immune system just overlooks them. It doesn't see them, so that's why they don't act on them. Then some cancer cells, they release a lot of immune suppressive factors, which will directly or indirectly suppress the immune response. Maybe it will prevent the immune cells from coming close to them. Maybe it will prevent it from binding to them. And then there is T cell checkpoint regulation. And as you can see that there's a bunch of different receptors or proteins which are expressed on the cell surface. And the T cell checkpoint dysregulation means that by one way or the other, either these are not expressed or they're not functional. And that does not let the T cells bind to these and then destroy these cells. So T cells are the active police force, like the SWAT team. So they will come and destroy the cancer cells in a normal situation, or not only cancer cells, any kind of foreign body in a normal cell. So a tumor, which is a, like osteosarcoma, which is a very immune resistant um, tumor, what that will do is it will go to all lengths to prevent destruction by this immune population. And that is what we mean by immune evasion or immune escape. So this is, this is how the, the mechanistic way of how uh, antigen presenting um, cell or, or the cancer cells actually um, evade the immune um, therapy, immune um, cells, I guess. They have this, so these co-stimulatory molecules which we saw in the previous screen, the bunch of different receptors. So those are actually, they are kind of like don't eat me signals. If you have some of them present on the cells, the T cell will not see the cancer cells and be like, oh, this is a part of the host. I don't need to destroy it and then go away. And so these different things are actually the barriers because of which in cancers like osteosarcoma or pancreatic cancer, the immune therapy doesn't work. However, what we are trying to see is that, is there any way we can trick the cancer cells to kind of either downregulate these don't eat me signals or somehow bring in more of the immune, uh, immune cells into their microenvironment, into their neighborhood, so that they can actually work and actually destroy the cells. And that is where my research comes in. So in a, hypoxia is lack of oxygen. So what happens is as a tumor cell grows further and further away from a blood vessel, the blood vessel, as you all know, brings in the oxygen and the nutrients. So as it is going further and further away from the blood vessels, they have these regions called hypoxic regions, which are low in oxygen. And this low in oxygen region, like we talked before in the, in the context of metabolism, they actually make a lot of lactate. Now the lactate cannot stay in the cells because what lactate is actually lactic acid. What happens is if there's a lot of acid, the cells will die and the cancer cells for sure don't want to die. So they efflux it or they secrete it out of their cells. So now these osteosarcoma cells, this is osteosarcoma cartoon, so they secrete all this acid out into their microenvironment. Now once it, it is secreted out in the microenvironment, 
what does it do? It now completely modifies its neighborhood, completely modifies its microenvironment in a way that all these inflammatory molecules, as you can see, the inflammation under the inflammation bar, um, section, they will not, they will be suppressed and which will eventually lead to the tumor not being responsive to any kind of immune therapy or in, in this case. So uh, what we in my lab and Dr. Truco, who was my collaborator, um, who's right now in Cleveland, what we hypothesized was that, okay, if the osteosarcoma cells are flushing out lactate with that efficiency, what if we block it? So if we block the flushing out of lactate into the microenvironment, wouldn't that result in, in a two-pronged attack? First of all, it will build up lactate, which will result in the cell death. And secondly, won't it now suppress, now it will revert all the things that the lactate was doing, like preventing the inflammatory, um, the immune cells from coming in and make it more conducive towards immune therapy. In other words, won't it sensitize osteosarcoma cells to immune therapy if we can inhibit the lactate um, um, uh, secretion? So one of the proteins which is used in, which the cell uses for lactate secretion is called CA9 or carbonic anhydrase 9. This is the one that is in blue here, which in, in panel A. So this protein, it has a number of members and the CA9 is the one which is the most effective in flushing out lactate from the cells in form of acid. And CA9 is, um, has been used for the last five, six years by different groups to use uh, in, in clinical trials as um, a very efficient inhibitor of lactate efflux. And actually, okay, no, never mind. Um, and um, I'm going to come to it before it's, it's right now recruiting for pancreatic cancer. It has been, I think it's finished its phase one trial for renal cancer. And it has shown that we, CA9 is really effective. Okay, so when we, when we looked into, when we first got into osteosarcoma and um, immune therapy, the first thing you want to know is, okay, what is the status of infiltrated immune cells in osteosarcoma? So does it have which part of, if you remember the four different immune escape mechanism we discussed, so which one of it is there? Is it that they have less checkpoint, more checkpoint inhibitors? Is it that they have less infiltrated tumor cells or is it something functional that is um, happening in, uh, in these cancers? So what we found, so this is actually a paper which came out a few years back. And what we found was that PDL1, which is one of the checkpoint um, markers of the uh, immune checkpoint markers, uh, that is associated with presence of tumor infiltrating uh, immune cells and antigen presenting cells in osteosarcoma, which kind of told us that infiltration of immune cells was not a problem in osteosarcoma. It's just that the immune cells that were in the microenvironment were not very effective in destroying it. So that gave us a clue that, okay, so when we are looking for an effective inhibitor, like a CA9 inhibitor, we need to study that aspect of how it is modifying the function of these immune cells so that they're not very effective because that's how we come up with efficient therapy. So we, what we, this is still a part of our hypothesis development and for any efficient science, you, you have to come up with a very solid hypothesis development. Um, so that you know what experiments to design. So just to recap, the tumor cells are making lactic acid and secreting it out. Now this lactate in the environment is polarizing these other family of immune cells called macrophages. Now macrophages come in two different uh, uh, types, the M1 macrophages and the M2 macrophages. The M1 macrophages are the good guys. So if you have a lot of M1 macrophages, that will mean it will draw in a lot of immune cells. They will be more effective and the tumor will be destroyed. However, in the presence of lactate, M1 macrophages are not many in number. You have a lot more M2 macrophages. And M2 macrophages are the bad guys. So when you have M2 macrophages, they secrete this protein called IL-10. And this makes a, the separate family of immune cells called the dendritic cells, what we call tolerogenic. So tolerogenic is in one word, they are inefficient in doing their function. They will not do their job. They will not have effective antigen presentation. And eventually, this is how they will contribute to immunization. So we knew that. 
that, okay, so lactate is probably modifying the dendritic cells to compromise their functions. So in order to do that, we first have to block the lactate and then we have to see that what is doing to the immune population in the cell and or making the cells more responsive to immune therapy. So we decided to go kind of like a top-down approach. So we wanted to inhibit the CA9 and then we wanted to see, first of all, that, you know, it, is it actually sensitizing to immune therapy? Because if it is not, then it doesn't matter what the how it is making the environment different because it's not going to help us. So that's how far we've gone here. And then that's what we are working on right now. So, um, so first things first, we wanted to see that osteosarcoma, which is a very hypoxic tumor, does it have an expression of CA9? And CA9, remember, the protein was the protein that was flushing out lactate. So yes, or initially we, we saw what was kind of confirmatory. These are different osteosarcoma cell lines. And when you put them in hypoxia, you have a lot of expression of CA9. So it meant that CA9 could be inhibited in a hypoxic osteosarcoma. And these are the clinical trial data that I was talking about. This is in breast cancer. And as you can see, unfortunately, the, the resolution is breaking up in this uh, Zoom. But um, as you can see that there is a lot less tumor burden in breast cancer when you just treat with the inhibitor of CA9. And in pancreatic cancer, when you treat it with gemcitabine, there is an increased survival in this. So basically what this told us was that the CA9 inhibitor was good. It was effective in clinical trials. So this was definitely one of the more promising candidates to look at in, um, in combination with immune therapy in osteosarcoma. Okay, so we want, like I said, the, our first goal was to see, does a, the um, CA9 inhibitor sensitize to um, immune therapy? So we chose anti-PD-1 therapy. That's one of the common Im immune checkpoint inhibitors. So we wanted to see that. Now, there is a challenge involved there. When you want to model immune therapy, you need to have an intact immune system. Now, you would think that why wouldn't anybody have a, why wouldn't a lab animal have an intact immune system? So here's the problem. So normally this, this cartoon here lists all the different kinds of model we use for cancer. So one of the most common model is the, you have cells in a plate, they are derived from mouse, mouse tumors, and you put them back in a wild type mouse, which has a complete immune system, and it forms a tumor. The other one is, you buy these what are called genetically modified mouse or you make genetically modified mouse which have tissue specific genetic mutation and they will spontaneously develop cancer. So these are two of the most popular models to study any kind of drug interaction or any kind of drug efficacy in um, animal models, in mouse models. However, there's a problem. While you can, they're great for testing immune therapy, they are made in lab which means that they do not reflect the variability which you normally see from patient to patient. And that is one of the reasons why if your preclinical studies are only made on syngenetic mice or in genetically engineered mice, when they go to the clinics, you don't always see a very successful translation because it doesn't account for the variability in lifestyle or food habits or just environment or anything of that sort. The more ideal way is, which has developed again over the last 10, 12 years, is what is called a PDX, so patient tumor derived xenograft. So in this, a tumor is removed from a patient during when the patient is undergoing either surgical resection or when, you are, when the patient is undergoing a biopsy of some sort. The tumor tissue is implanted into an immune deficient mice and that, it's allowed to grow in that immune deficient mice. Now, why would I need immune deficient mice for this? Because in a healthy mouse, the immune system is going to kill the cancer cell if it is cross species. So that is why it will not grow in a normal mouse. So while this captures the patient to patient variability, the problem in this is you can't test immune therapy in these models. So that kind of puts people in a jam. So what, what, do, what is the best way going forward then? Of course, we are gonna first start with the syngenetic model where we put in mouse cancer cells in a mouse and then go ahead and test it to see if our hypothesis is correct. But eventually, if I really want to go a step forward and take it to the clinics, I will need to have a model which will account for the patient variability and will also have an intact immune system. So the ideal choice is then development of a humanized mouse model. 
Now, this seems like a very sci-fi type thing, but actually this has been a really popular choice over the last five years. So what happens here is there are several ways of doing it. You can have either um, human hematopoietic stem cells, which is what we do, and you inject that in mice, in immunodeficient mice, and you wait for them to grow. So in, during this process, the entire uh, immune deficient mice is actually taken over by this human hematopoietic stem cells. And it, it, it grows its own human immune system. Now, if you, if you um, implant a human tissue in it, it's going to not reject, it's going to grow, and it's going to grow with the human immune system. So that is the goal here. But we are far from there, so bear with me. Um, so in, for looking at CN9 inhibition in osteosarcoma, so these are the different models we used. So like I said, in syngenetic model, which is the mouse cells in mouse, uh, we, we used what is called an experimental metastasis model. Now, osteosarcoma is very interesting in modeling in a mouse. In the sense, it is extremely difficult because you don't, you have genetically modified mice, but only about 30 of 100 will probably grow a tumor. So that's not a very efficient model. You do have, you can put cells in the mouse bones and wait for them to grow. Not all cell lines will grow, some will. Not all cell lines will metastasize. So it becomes a even greater challenge to model it for preclinical studies. So these are the ones which have been working in my lab and which we have been going forward. So when you just want to look at the metastatic burden, so osteosarcoma typically metastasizes to the lungs. So if you now put osteosarcoma cells in the tailwind of a mouse, it's like you know dumping a solution in the sink and then looking for it in your sink pipe. It's kind of like that. Uh, it will go and colonize in the lungs. So if you want to see if your drug is just preventing that tumor seeding or is curing that um, uh, seeded tumor, that's a great model to do. And you can have labeled cells where you can track a bit luminescence imaging, or you can have unlabeled cells which you can track with histology. And then the other one is you, in, you inject the cells, you implant the cells in the bone microenvironment, and then wait for them to develop tumors and metastasis. And of course you have the humanized mice which we are trying to develop in the lab. So this is the experimental metastasis model that I um, kind of described. So with a label cell, you can image and you can look at the lung images, whereas in unlabeled cells, it's a little more conventional and you look at the histology, you need a pathologist to do that to tell you whether or not you have tumors in the lungs. So we first tested our combination with the experimental metastasis model and this is our experimental design. So we used the CA9 inhibitor, the WBI5111 is our CA9 inhibitor. And we injected, um, uh, we used it with anti-PD-1 immune therapy. And um, these are the mouse lungs, and I'm gonna go forward, but it, it wasn't very hopeful. It didn't really give us a very encouraging picture here when we just counted the tumors of the lung tissues. However, when we looked at the histology, and this was much better. As you can see in um, the combination, there were a lot less tumors in, um, in the combination group compared to the control or the single treatment group. And we can see the quantitation in the, in the bar graphs next to it. Now, when we then looked into the proliferating cells using a tumor marker, that was even more remarkable. So these are the brown stain in the control. The brown parts in the control are actually your rapidly dividing cells. And as you can see in your combination, you can have lot, first of all, you have lot less tumor and you have lot less of those brown cells, which tells you that the proliferating cells were actually dying with um, the CA9 and anti-PD-1 combination. So we next wanted to do an um, intraosseous model in which you implant the tumor cells in the bones. And this is just an example from one of our models that we are doing right now. If you implant the cells, so this is the imaging you do, it's called bioluminescence imaging and it can show up in different intensities and you can follow it. So if you've injected the tumor cells in the bone and you see the image in the lungs, that's a direct um, correlation or direct uh, evidence that the tumor has metastasized to the lungs. And this was again, our experimental design, similar to the last one. And this is ongoing right now, but I just showed, I'm, I'm gonna just show you our six week data, which has been quite promising. 
and we have right now we can see and this is a quantitation of the image um, um, image uh, intensity as you can see that um, the combination therapy is starting to look good it looks like it is really inhibiting the tumor uh, primary tumor um, but it's ongoing we have to keep it for another few weeks to see whether or not the tumor and the metastasis and everything went down with this so uh, in the last uh, few slides, uh, let me talk about the humanized mice that we are developing. So we call it the BLT mice. So in this, we implant the human th uh, thymus and the fetal uh, tissue, which are rich in hematopoietic stem cells and into the liver, into the um, uh, kidney cells of the mouse, because it is, the reason we choose the kidney is because it's very heavily vascularized. So it gets a lot of blood supply. It helps the mouse to develop um, a robust immune system. And then we also implant some CD34 positive human um, cells in the tailwind. So together with this double hit, this mouse, this immunocompromised mouse in 12 weeks becomes really, really, really humanized. And uh, I'm gonna skip through the experimental design. It's kind of similar to what we had before, but this was the first very impressive data set we had. So when we looked at the humanization and the how we, we look at humanization by looking at the human, um, the human antibodies in the mouse blood. And if you can see the percent column in my, in my table, you can see that about 80 to 90% of the uh, humanization was obtained in our, um, in our model. And just for the records for uh, everyone else, Anything above 25% is considered humanized. So we have a great humanized model. So we next um, implanted it. So this was, um, we wanted to just, we've got, we got the humanization, we were very excited about it. So we just implanted cells in the, we injected cells in the tail vein again. And then we looked at survival because this was the easiest way for us to judge whether or not our therapy was working. And um, looks like it was, because if you could see the green bar, in both the survival graphs as well as in the mortality graph, you can see that you can you have lot less um, dead animals in our combination group, and obviously reflected in the survival graph here, that a lot of them are surviving much more than the others. So this is an ongoing process right now in the lab. So we have obtained a lot of uh, patient-derived tumors. So our next goal will be to actually implant these tumors in the mice, either in the bones or get cells from them and implant them or inject them in the tailway and to um, develop this mouse model and um, do robust preclinical testing to move forward and see if it's, this combination is really effective or not. And with that, um, I would really like to acknowledge, I, I talked of my present team, um, the members listed here are the past members of my group who have graduated and you know, moved on to the next phase of their life. Um, I'm really indebted to Dr. Trent, who's at University of Miami, and Dr. Truco and um, Dr. Huang from Cleveland. And they have been, Matteo actually got me into the whole osteosarcoma research because of our shared interest in tumor metabolism and metabolic inhibitors. And I'm really grateful to him for introducing me to all of you and the whole, whole field in general. And my, I would like to acknowledge my different funding sources, obviously without whom research is not possible. And Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Okay. So, uh, by the way, great collaborators. We we are big fans of Dr. Truco, Dr. Wong, Dr. Trent. Really big fans. Lactate in tumor cell in tumor cells. So, can we naturally produce lactate in a way that fights cancer? I mean, I understand that it's it's a product of metabolism and energy, but does this speak to exercise as a prevention for cancer or is totally its own? So that's actually a very interesting question, Anne. Um, we would like to think so, right? That if you exercise more, will that be preventing or not? Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, no. Um, every cell type or every tissue system has its own little... Um, own little you know niche where how it works in cancer it is um, it, what the cancer cells do is they just hijack that whole thing production of lactate and eliminating it is a natural process of any healthy tissue 
it wouldn't like any lactate being built up in it because it's going to be detrimental for any kind of cells, including cancer cells. But what the cancer cells have done here is by making them in a situation with modifying their microenvironment, modifying their mutation levels or their epigenetics or whatever, like their whole system in a way that they can now use this waste product to their benefit. Okay, I have a question that's a much smarter question than mine from uh, Amy. She's asking, how does the CA9 inhibitor affect the rest of the non-tumor cells in the body? Uh, the CA9 is an interesting protein because it only expresses when there is low oxygen. So only in the in hypoxic tissues. So typically, any solid tumor, the inside is really hypoxic. So it would typically be only expressed and only functional in those tissues. So um, I don't think the healthy cells will care as much for um, CA9 inhibitors. And from the success of the phase one trials where they do those limiting toxicities, they actually, I think that answers the question that they were able to get those limiting toxicity and move on to the next phase, which kind of tells me that at least apparently there is no um, toxic issues on the healthy cells. Um, however, this is a membrane protein and membrane proteins are incredibly difficult to get in a soluble form, um, the inhibitors for them. So sometimes they have to be packed into some sort of a carrier, which can have its effect on healthy tissues as well. So there is like a, um, a balance there as to like how much you can package in that carrier for an efficient delivery versus the efficacious dose. And that's something for the pharma companies to figure out. But as far as in a, like for example, if I have cancer cells and I have normal cells in a dish and I add the inhibitor, the CA9 will not do anything to the normal cells. Uh, challenges with the humanized mouse model? Plenty. Yeah. Plenty. This is like an uphill battle. Um, it's, uh, it's, it takes about, uh, first of all, the human, okay. So like I said, a cancer cell from a human cell line or a patient doesn't like growing in a full immune system. So there's a lot of rejection. So normally if you would take a patient tissue and then implant it in an immune um, competent mouse, it will not grow because the immune system is there. There will be a lot of rejection. Um, and which is why you always implant it in a compromised mouse and that's where it grows. So hence the whole reason for humanization. The main challenge with the humanized mouse is, um, and as you can see that we didn't use the easier option of the PBMC model, which is the peripheral blood induced model, is the graft versus host disease. So if you use the, the easier model where you are doing it in a quicker, um, quicker way, it leads to severe uh, GVHD and the mouse dies before you can actually get anything meaningful. So you can't use that. So you have to use, so th those models are actually um, useful for studying inflammation, inflammatory diseases, like if you want to study colitis or you know stuff like that, then you can use those models. But for cancer, it's a, it's a longer model too. So if you have to test a drug in cancer, you have to at least have the model humanized for at least two months before that, otherwise you can't make out if you're drug is efficacious or not. So for that, plus the time it takes for humanization makes it a bigger challenge to do it. Plus the process is quite invasive. Implanting the cells in the kidney capsule, you need very specific skill sets to do it and training sets to do it. So yeah, the challenges are monumental and that is why, um, so we've, we've been like working, we've been at it since I think last October and even without, well, then COVID kind of stopped everything, but even without it, it probably would have, it, it's an uphill battle. So yes, it is very challenging. Yeah. To answer your third question of why 25% uh, is considered humanized, uh, these animals are irradiated before the human cells are put in, so they completely destroy all the immune system. So that is more of a statistics issue that people have seen, that even if it is as low as 25% humanized, it can actually mimic the properties of the human immune cells. So that is why that's considered like an absolute low cutoff. But obviously, if you have more and more humanization, your effects are going to be much better. Yeah. Uh, let's go back to the BLT mouse. That sounds really super unappetizing. Yes. <laughs> I think I'm going to order a BLT the same after hearing about a BLT mouse. 
Um, <laughs> any, any looking forward, any possibility of working with canine osteosarcoma patients? Sure. Uh, what are the challenges I, there? Um, yeah, the, I, I think that is a completely, and in fact, you know, it's funny you mention it because today morning itself, I got, uh, you know, those uh, newsletters which uh, came to me because I guess I have a lot of osteosarcoma in my mail list now, um, asking, talking about fund, funding opportunities for canine cancers and canine osteosarcoma. So I think that is an, a relatively untapped field, which I think we should tap into because yeah. it's one of the most prevalent cancers in dogs. Right. Uh, yeah. Very and, painful. And, you know, not unlike human um, osteosarcoma parents, the canine oh, yeah. osteosarcoma parents are desperate to absolutely, try to absolutely. And our last, you know, every factor conference, we try to have at least one uh, veterinary medicine physician mm -hmm. who's working with uh, canine osteosarcoma patients and their work is fascinating and it seems to of course move much faster yeah in canine osteosarcoma than in human osteosarcoma mm -hmm. so yeah that's really um really a great possibility um and uh happy to connect you with somebody if you <laughs> oh yeah absolutely and I, I think i'm gonna use and i was actually very impressed with the whole MIB thing. And uh, it's it's been, you know, asking for grant money and everything, it's it's kind of been rough. But I think you have an endless resources, which is going to, it's, it's an amazing network. And I'm really happy to be a part of it. Oh, thank you. It's it's really, you know, we've, we have found our people and our people, we have a large tent, so our people keep growing all the time. And by our people, I mean our collective. We belong to each other. Absolutely. We are inextricably connected through desperation, trying to make it better for our kids with this disease. And I, we haven't run across anybody who has said, you know, no, I'm not interested in sharing or no, I'm not interested in interested in working together or collaborating. So it's, it's been, I, I think it's really that kind of spirit of all parties is really going to move this field. Yes, forward. absolutely. Absolutely. Quickly. Okay. This is a, this is probably a strange question as well, but I hadn't heard of those hallmarks of cancer uh -huh. that you were talking about at the beginning of your talk. Yeah. Are any of those, is that, is that something that's in the researcher community? That's not. I think so. Okay. Yeah. I've never heard of that. Because the uh, Dr. We Dr. Weinberg is a Nobel laureate, right? And um, he he is one of the eminent um, cancer biologists of his kind, and he's in MIT. And he came up with this. It, it I think it is the most cited paper in 2000, when his first six hallmarks came, and it was as if like he condensed all the cancer research into characterizing these cancer cells into these six parameters. But to me, what was more fascinating is that in just 11 years, he had to update his list and put it instead of six, then he expanded to like, I don't know, 10 probably, um, which I think was very interesting that we knew so much after the genome came out to that point that those six were very broad and we couldn't fit in most of the things which we knew to be true for cancer. So I kind of I kind of thought I should share it with everybody because personally it fascinates me a lot that the whole hallmark situation. Yeah, that's really interesting. I hadn't heard of it, and I thought that would be. I, I who knows that? Like, <laughs> does my treating oncologist know that and go, well, this is your sort of brand of cancer and. You know, it'd be cool to have like an algorithm. Uh, algorithm, yeah. Well, you know, um, I think they are. So this is just for um, for research interest. And like I said, um, kind of condensing 80 years of research into one figure kind of a thing. But uh, with the TCGA databases being available for most solid cancers, they're, they're actually trying to map it and map in terms of heterogeneity and everything to see if there is some sort of a prediction as to the kind of cancers you have. So that's actually in progress. And the other thing is that there is a lot of these interest in algorithm development or mathematical modeling based on, based. I, I think it stems from these hallmarks, but eventually it gets translated from the public databases. 
yeah. which have the raw data to kind of translate it into something more meaningful. Yeah. Um, we're working with the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard on the Osteosarcoma Project to inform this wide, wide database that would then be widely available for researchers to have this data. Yeah, they already have collected um, quite a lot of data that's available on the CBIO portal that mm -hmm. has revealed some things that they didn't realize were kind of common or CBIO see see portal have uh, osteosarcoma now? Oh, that's yeah. amazing. I actually, I, I use it a lot for pancreatic cancer. I used it a couple of years back. It didn't have it. Yeah. And so that that's good to know. Yeah, it's on. I'll go back and check. Okay, believe it or not, we have 10 minutes left and like we consider this overtime because we usually, we kind of plan 45 minutes and then when we get talking, it kind of, time gets away from us when it's such an interesting <laughs> talk. Um, and along with our brand new um, MIB headquarters, we have a new component to Osteobite, which um, Dr. Banerjee is um, just humoring us with. And uh, <laughs> so we have some questions. Um, you ready? This is rapid yes. fire. So rapid fire? Okay. Yeah, let's go. Okay. What profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Um, being an astronaut. Ooh. And do research in space. You're not necessarily cancer research, like <laughs> astro research. Yeah, awesome. That, that's like my ideal self. I would like to do that. Wow. You know, well, it's out there in the universe now. So, yeah. you know, yeah. who knows? Yeah. Who knows? Um, what was your first job? Um, I have always been a cancer researcher, uh, not a cancer researcher, a researcher, like a scientist, always. Oh my gosh. Favorite snack? S'mores. Yes, yeah, see, you need my same kind of cookies. They're huh. so good. Uh, what do you hope for? That's a, uh, uh, well, I am a, a sci-fi buff and I am a space nerd. So and I, I most of my philosophies are driven by Gene Roddenberry and Star Trek. So eventually, I think I would strive for that kind of an ideal world, yeah. where the petty things don't matter anymore, and you look at the broader, greater good of mankind. I know it sounds super cheesy, but I, I have a 14-year-old son, and I keep telling him that the prime directive is the way to go. You, you want to be out there where all a person's appearance, uh, the nitty-gritties don't matter anymore. You're for the, you, you like a person because of the goodness. Your soul. Like, so that's, that's how it is. So I think yeah. that is what I would like to get to. I so, love that. What do I hope for? Uh, what superpower would you choose? Define gravity. Ooh. See, we've got a space theme just all the way through here. Yeah, no, I know. I, I told you, like, I'm an incredibly boring person. So in my real life. So I have this alter self, kind of like the Clark Kent kind of. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it makes me laugh. So in that, um, I'm like a super person. I am an astronaut and I go to like these bizarre places across galaxies. Yeah. And I can, I have my grav boots and whatnot and like meet cool life forms. So that's my, that's my alter ego. So yeah, that's where the space thing is there. Okay. Actually, my desktop also has the, the, the nebulas and the Eagle's Nest nebula on it. And that's my Twitter handle, Twitter picture, profile picture too. So, yeah. Okay. So, dream collaborator? I think I already have that. You do? With, with Dr. Chuko and Dr. Wong and Dr. Trent, I think I'm there. Yeah, you've got a dream team going on. Uh, what inspired you to be a researcher? Especially at such a young age, your first job. You know, um, I visited a research lab first with my dad. My dad is a geophysicist. Uh, okay. I visited a research lab with him when I was 12. And it was, now that I think of it, it wasn't a very exciting lab to start with, but they were doing a lot of very cool stuff with stuff they had collected um, from a volcano. I think there was an active volcano in one of the Indian islands and they had collected uh, some specimens from there. And they were like, I guess they were prepping them for storage or display or research or whatever. I thought that was one of the most incredible things I have seen. And that's when I decided that this is the way to go. 
So obviously things got lost between 12 and 24. So I ended up being in a, a biology research, but my first, my PhD was on um, GI parasites. So very cool parasites. Um, and then eventually I kind of migrated into cancer and cancer research. So yeah, long way, but I think, I think that's what probably flipped the switch that no, I have to do research. Yeah, now I see the connection with you and Trent on, uh, on GI, okay. GI issues. <laughs> okay, favorite word? Flabbergasted. Oh, good one. Okay, uh, and last one. What do you need to accomplish your work? What could help you make your work easier, better, faster, more effective? Um, there is um, a major thing that every scientist needs, two major things actually. One is money and the two is space, like space to work. Space yeah, to yeah. Space. other <laughs> space, yeah. yeah. Um, and those are always wanting, you can never have enough of those. I have an incredible group of people who are working with me and I, uh, I almost all the time I get very enthusiastic people who are willing to do good, they're willing to put in, like even now it's, it's four o'clock, Trump is in the city and it's going to be a nightmare going back home. I have people planning experiments which are going to go till midnight and doing it. And I am not telling them to do it, it's just their calling. Yeah. And I have these people who are very motivated, very driven, who are there. And I think that's, that's incredible. So yeah, if I can have the, the money and the space, I have enough by God's grace. But if um, for making, doing bigger and better things, those are, I think, the only two limitations. Wow. Yeah, a dedicated team is... Yes, that's all you can ask for. Yeah. That's very motivated, brilliant, too. and and um, motivated to make it better. Yes, for humanity. Um, yes. Back to question number four. <laughs> <laughs> so well yes. done, go team. Um, okay, so thank you. That was really fun. I love doing that. I right, will have to do that again next week. Yeah, when, yeah. When we have Dr. Oh, yeah, Kim, yeah. Kim, she'll be joining us from the Children's Cancer Therapy Development Institute. Dr. Kim will be speaking about reversing checkpoint adaptation, making osteosarcoma treatments work better. Be sure and subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can view our library of 25 now osteobites topics with our rock star and um, space star speakers. You can also listen to osteobites via podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you for joining us today. And thank you so much to our brilliant guest, Dr. Banerjee, for your work, Dr. Banerjee, and for being with us today. Together, we make it better for osteosarcoma kids everywhere.